Coming up next on Arizona Horizons, Journalists Roundtable reports of threats against the state school's chief and a top assistant, and the legislature offers a solution to the dust-up between the school's chief and the governor. The Journalists Roundtable is next on Arizona Horizons. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable. I'm Ted Simons. Joining us tonight, Jim Small of the Arizona Capital Times, Howard Fisher of Capital Media Services, and Bob Christie of the Associated Press. Superintendent of Public Instruction Diane Douglas and her Special Projects Director Leah Landrum Taylor notified police of threatening messages they received this week. Jim, what's this all about? Yeah, this is a story that one of my colleagues wrote this week. Um, basically, some, some harassing and threatening uh, emails and letters and packages uh, had been sent to both uh, both Diane Douglas and Leah Landrum Taylor. And in, in fact, even uh, Leah Landrum Taylor had her tires slashed. Uh, she discovered uh, on her way to work earlier this week. And uh, it's, you know, so ang anger, I think, uh, seemed to be, we, we didn't get a whole lot of indication, a whole lot of details about what was in the letters, but you know, some anger, especially at Leah Landrum Taylor, for being a Democrat uh, and working in this, uh, working for someone who's uh, certainly very conservative. I know that this followed a series of meetings with the black community and NAACP as well. Do they think there's any connection there regarding maybe someone who could have been at the meetings? Uh, you know, they, they really didn't release a whole mm -hmm. lot of details. They've turned everything over to police. I, I think Phoenix Police is, has been working on it, and I would imagine DPS is as well. And, and all this is indicative of the amazing amount of vitriol on all sides over the issues of Common Core, the firings that were related to Common Core, who's funding education, do you like Doug Ducey, do you like Diane Douglas, you know, where does Christine Thompson fit into this? And no one is talking rationally, not at the legislature, not the debate that, that we cover, and it's all become a matter of emotions, and that's what spills over in this. But isn't there a bill now to clarify this, this dust-up, uh, as I call it, between uh, uh, the governor and Diane Douglas? Aren't, aren't we on the road to uh, something here? Uh, the deal has been cut. Uh, the legislature this week amended a bill that would put in statute what the governor said, which is, I'm, you know, the, Diane Douglas has no power to fire the board's executive director. And, of course, Diane Douglas was down at the, at the committee mm -hmm. hearing at the Senate this, this week saying, I support this. This is, you know, this shows that I was right all along. I just want to clarify things, uh -huh. and I want to save the taxpayers' money. Uh -huh. it, it was spin in its, uh, uh -huh. in its Exa best. Exactly, and that's the, the, the darndest thing. I l saw the bill, I listened to the speech, and I said, did she get a different copy of this legislation than the rest of us? I mean, it made it very clear, hiring and firing of the board's employees, done by the board. Control of the board employees, done by the board. Who pays the board employees through the Department of Administration, not the board of not the State right. Department of Education? Well, and, and she wanted travel reimbursement. She wanted hours. She right. wanted OKs for schedules and meetings. And the bill says uh, no, no, and no. No, no, and no. And this, this, uh, I think her uh, presentation to the Education Committee of the Senate on on uh, Wednesday was designed specifically to say, Doug, Doug Ducey and I are are, are now friends. Um, the governor spoke with her, or met with her, uh, uh, supposedly called her on Valentine's Day, he told us on Monday, and then he, and he said, you know, we're fine. Um, we're going to work together. Uh, uh -huh. and, how, and here's the thing. How long is that going to last? Even after that, she sent out a release at one point saying, well, I like what's going on, but Doug shouldn't have cut this in his budget. This is not a truce that's going to last. Well, this, this, is, this is going to get nasty. She, do, she has said publicly she doesn't believe that Doug Ducey is really committed to his campaign promise of getting rid of Common Core. She has lobbied the legislature for more money even as Doug has done his shell game of well we'll move a little here and a little there and, and everything is fine. This is a truce that's not going to last. And we the Auditor General report today showing how much classroom spending, non-classroom spending is out there and the governor saying that this is, you know, we got to get more money to the classroom and then D Diane Douglas saying a war, a, applauding teachers for how much they're doing with what they have in underfunded schools. That's, that's true. And if you look at uh, classroom spending over the last seven or eight years, uh, the differential between classroom spending and support spending, which includes administrators, school buses, air conditioning, buildings, all those other things, uh, has, has gone down. And that's primarily because st uh, state funding has gone down. 
as the governor probably knows, you have fixed costs in a business, or in, in if you sell less ice cream, those fixed costs still remain the same. So the differential changes. It sounded like the report showed that uh, administration spending uh, pretty much stayed the same. Well, actually, it depends on how you define it. Pure administrative. Yes. Su superintendents, you know, the, the attendance clerks and everything else. We are actually below the national average, and it stayed the same as a percentage. Where we run higher are our utilities. Uh, transportation. We, transportation, you know, school buses, and the support services. And I was talking to Chuck Essex from the school and, uh, administrative association, school business officials. And he said, look, you've got charter schools out there who are recruiting kids because they can go to those schools. They're not actively recruiting the kids with disabilities. So the school districts are left with a higher proportion of kids with disabilities who need the guidance counselors, who need the speech pathologists, which are non-classroom expenses. Yet this also gets to the category of what's classroom. Coaches are, cl are classroom. You know, the band is classroom. The, 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 the counselors, the librarians are not, and that becomes a whole different issue. Right, and, and, and the poorer the district, the, the, the more children who are on free and reduced lunch program, that's a non-classroom expense. So if you have, as we see in the recession, as, as the number of, of children in the state who are getting qualifying for, for free federal lunch goes up, that counts against mm -hmm. non-classroom spending. And as we have now, we're talking about spending, but we're also talking about Common Core. The Senate votes to preserve Common Core. So what's going on out there? Well, it's, <laughs> you know, it, it's essentially what we've seen the past couple of years it is the efforts to undo Common Core are really, they don't have the votes in the legislature. As much as there may be a furor in, in, in a lot of circles, and you know, it, Diane Douglas got elected and, and Doug Ducey came out opposed to it during the campaign. It, you know, the reality is that at the, at the Capitol, there just aren't the votes to undo to, or, or to, to, to block Common Core and, and to direct the State Board of Ed to do something right. else. And, Part of that is cost. The state's already spent a huge amount of money to implement this plan. And Diane Douglas has come out and said, listen, I don't want to completely eliminate it right away. I want to slowly change it over time because we've already invested the money. The other thing that's happening at the legislature, which I find really interesting, is the same thing that happened last year. Efforts to increase our voucher program, the empowerment scholarships accounts, efforts to increase uh, the school tuition organizations, that's running into a roadblock, primarily because the legislature, a majority of the legislature, not necessarily the conservative Republicans, but a majority of the legislature believes that schools are underfunded. And if you're taking money into these voucher programs and more to put into new testing in place, that's going to take away from the public schools, which have 80 percent of the kids. And that's the key. On a lot of these programs, they say, well, see, there's a cap on them, but that cap can increase 20 percent a year. You don't have to be a math whiz to figure out 20% a year, you compound it out, and all of a sudden you've got $600, $700 million being put into voucher programs, being put into alternatives that you say, well, wait, what about the kids who are stuck in the neighborhood schools simply because those are the ones they can walk to? Didn't the bill, the, the, the bill that Senator Kelly Ward was behind, didn't it also let school districts to develop their own test? And if you want a Common Core, you could keep it, but if you didn't want it, you didn't. What happened I, I've to that? I've heard that line. If you'd like your Common Core, you can keep it. Uh, <laughs> the, I think this was meant as, as, as a backstop, the idea that we, we want local choice. Well, one of the problems becomes is how do you then compare District A to District B to District C? And then how do you compare Arizona to the rest of the nation? That was the problem with Ames, is the, you know, everyone said, are we 46th, 48th, 49th? Well, there's no comparison. Common Core and the tests that link to them would have provided that. Right. Uh, you know, this is a nice local control issue, but then you also you've got another bill going through that the House voted on earlier this week to say, and parents can keep their kids out of these tests. Right. Well, how does that help to, to get the, the kind of data you need. So what does what does a governor Ducey do in a pro when if these things do eventually reach his desk where you got to make a decision on Common Core, you got to make a decision on the test that comes with Common Core. What what's he going to do? I don't know. Uh, honestly, and, and I don't know that any of us do because you know it was a campaign promise that, or a campaign <coughs> you know statement that he he opposed Common Core and that he wanted Arizona to have its own standards. What does that mean exactly, though? Yeah. And, and does it mean you you repeal Common Core, or you you yeah. statutorily block us from participating, or does it mean that maybe you find a way to to take what exists as Common Core and 
gussy it up and change it up a little bit and put some put some saguaro cactus stickers on it and call it an Arizona plant. Wait, wait, we, didn't we do that? Aren't these Arizona's college and career ready standards? It isn't Common yeah. Core. Oh, yeah, we're, we're already going down yeah. the road of that. I yeah, mean, we right. started yeah. we started under that with with uh, with Governor Brewer and, and Superintendent Hoopenthal. One more thing on education here before we move on: uh, dueling robocalls regarding uh, the governor's education budget and the Mesa super, uh, superintendent right. here. This actually started a couple of weeks ago when several. Uh, Two or three hundred school superintendents sent out letters to all their kids, and then the Mesa School District superintendent used his automated phone system to call parents and, and advise them, you know, call your legislature, tell them that, that this budget proposal from the governor uh, underfunds our schools. And then uh, a, a group which had supported Governor Ducey in the election uh, responded quickly and did their own robocalls. Uh, that kind of tells you that. Uh, the governor is maybe touchy about this. I mean, if a, if he wasn't nervous about it, you wouldn't see a group that backs him. Probably. I mean, I don't want to put a are nexus you, are there. Are you and suggesting that they work in tandem on this? I, uh, but it doesn't not, matter. This isn't the political yeah. campaign. You know. Yeah. See, everybody talks about it's the dark money group, American Encore. Doesn't matter. This is not a ballot measure or anything else. Even if they were to call up and Doug were to call mm -hmm. Sean Noble and say, "Can you do this for me?" Doesn't well, matter. That was what was interesting. The initial response seemed to focus more on the fact that it was a dark money group that's calling mm -hmm. on behalf of Deuce. They can do that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And they've been able to do that. I mean, for yeah. forever under Arizona law. But there was a group. I remember what, 10 years ago, probably, that sent out mailers uh, going after, you know, in, in districts for legislators who were opposing Governor Napolitano's things. And it was a group that, I guess, dark money wasn't coined as a term back then, but it was essentially an issue advocacy group, mm -hmm. did the exact same thing but, back then. But, but the thing here, though, is that what they said, uh, the critics are saying, not accurate, uh, that Mesa spends nearly half outside, the, well below the national. That yeah. wasn't accurate. Uh, the idea that you know you're not you're not talking as you said about everything from air conditioning to school buses that was not on the robocall. So they're calling it critics are misleading at best. Yeah, and it, you know it's hard to to be absolutely factual in a 30 second phone call if you want to make your message. So you're right, they were not accurate, and and, and that's the problem with this whole clip. look. I've got a story for, for for the papers tomorrow on this latest Auditor General's report. It took me 1,100 words to describe all the intricacies of this. You're never going to do this in a 30 second call. Right. And I know it's shocking to think that somebody would do a robo call and, and just give you their side right. of the spin. But when it's, you say Mesa spends less than half their money out, outside the class, you know, yeah. more than half outside the classroom, and you don't describe what outside the class really means, yeah. is that really? It is not fair. And, and like I said, you cannot have schools you, it's nice to say we want more money in the classrooms, but you've got to have the classroom buildings, you've got to have the air conditioning, you've got to have the buses, you've got to have the school counselors, you've got to have all these other support services. And, and I think the governor is probably nervous that he, he, his budget, although he says it funds $134 million more mm -hmm. for classrooms, actually only, bottom line, only gives $11 million more to schools this year. That's a flat budget no matter how you look at it. And uh, he's he's worried that schools are going to get the parents behind. Uh, Department of Child Services, uh, the new chief has yes. decided to get rid of the investigative unit that investigated the new chief? Well, it, it, this is one of those funny situations where you actually had two investigative agencies within Department of Child Services, Child Safety, when it, when it was created. Some of it which carried over from the old DES. Uh, Greg McKay says, look, this OSI, Office of Special Investigations, was there, had a bunch of cops to look at what was going on in the agency. And he said, do I need cops investigating ourselves? If I've got a problem, I can call in police if it's a criminal problem. And he said, I want to put the bodies on the ground. I want to put them where, where they're needed. Now, of course, all this got mixed up with the whole issue as we're slowly finding out how Greg McKay purposely inadvertently shoved aside his predecessor, you know, Mr. Flanagan. And so it's been real interesting to see uh, the dynamics that, that took place. And did Flanagan screw up in terms of not reporting certain things? Well, perhaps. Did McKay's report about what Flanagan should have reported, was, was that a little overblown? Well, perhaps. Yeah. 
And so, you know, the, 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 this very wonderful right. little behind the scenes play is, is, is playing out in the public. And I know that your paper had a response now from Flanagan, who's had a chance to say something because we've had everything from an initial memo from Greg McKay saying, you know, there could possibly be some illegalities and irregularities. Now he's saying no more pet projects. I mean, he's. Uh, Flanagan has got to crawl from under the bus here uh, eventually, doesn't yeah, he? Yeah, and, and he, he spoke to us today and, and he, he defended, you know, his actions and what he did as director in, in, in really launching this agency and, and what he said were, you know, massive improvements in the way that the, the child safety system operates uh, and, and really pushed back against the idea that there were things that were illegal that were happening and that, that the priorities were wrong. He said, you know, look, we were always prioritizing, you know, safety of kids first, but you have to balance that with the reality that you've got to clear this backlog of these thousands of cases, which is what you're tasked to do and what you're told by the legislature to do first. So, you know, you're, you're trying to strike that balance between going, th doing a lot of this paperwork stuff with, uh, w with going out and putting people out in the field to, to deal with and, these kids. And, and the and fact is there are always going to be situations <laughs> that slide through the cracks. Now you can go back and you can look and say they should have known, you know, and I could look at it and say, my God, if I had seen that report, I would have gone out there. Um, You've got an overworked yeah. staff, and, and the fact is that things are going to happen, and much as we, we could put 10,000 caseworkers out there, and children are still going to die. But okay. still, the investigation, the internal probe was for accusations of sexual comments, harassment, work for those sorts of things. What's, what's that all about? You know, this is a big bureaucracy, and there's stuff that goes on inside that Flanagan thought he really needed to, to get some eyes on with real law enforcement investigators. I mean, now that they've gotten rid of this, what, what McKay says is, well, we can do this administratively. Well, who is best equipped to it? Who's going to do the investigation? You know, if it's criminal, okay, you bring in some police, but you still got to find out if it's criminal in the first place. Um, and, but the question becomes, do you have a standing police force within the agency? I mean, you know, the, the, that becomes a question. When you've got only X number of bodies, you know, are you better off saying, you know, I can put them into the Office of Child Welfare Investigations, I can put them on the street, I can do yeah. something else. That's, and that, that, that's a judgment call that every director yeah. makes. But that said, um, Flanagan put them in there intentionally because they had such serious problems before. And so if you, if you, you want to change the culture of, of a big bureaucracy like that, which is, as Howie mentioned, it's charged with these, you know, investigating horrible crimes, not taking children out of the home too quickly, not leaving them in one hour too long, and, and thousands and tens of thousands of cases and you know you've got to have some accountability and I think that's what Flanagan apparently was trying to do. And taking them out too quickly seems to be a, a, a special concern that that pendulum always goes back and forth it seems like it's over there on that side right now. Yeah and it, that's been one of I think the, the troubling things I think Governor Ducey started mentioning it in speeches more you know by the way 16,000 some odd kids I think that are in the foster care system it's a number that's that's been growing and, and I think it's it's disturbing a lot of people uh, both in the child welfare community and I think within the yeah. governor's office. And that goes part of to, to what Greg McKay said he said look Look, if we can get out there on the early reports and provide the family the services they need, provide the oversight, maybe we can prevent it from going back three weeks later and taking the kids out. And again, uh, the, the idea of, of prevention. Now, that said, the legislature did not fund a lot of the prevention efforts, you know, whether it's, it's subsidized child care or something else. So right. for all this talk <clears throat> about prevention, uh, you know, then, then the rubber meets the road when you say, what do you mean that's going to cost us And money? the governor swept the grandparents' stipends that Leo and Taylor fought mm -hmm. really hard for last year um, to, to help grandparents who, who end up with their children's kids. Right, right. Hey, you've got a couple of minutes left here, and, and something kind of happened here later in the day regarding the, uh, is it a tax, is it a, <laughs> uh, a fee, is it uh, something else entirely? What's going on regarding Medicaid and the, uh, the lawsuit again, the whole nine yards? Quickly, right. please. Well, as we know, three or four days, about a week before Governor Brewer left office, the Supreme Court came and said, yep, uh, the lawmakers, you can sue the governor over this assessment, which pays for the Medicaid expansion. Well, it's been really quiet ever since then. Nothing has happened, and the Supreme Court has sent the case back down to the trial court. Well, finally today, there's been a filing and, a, and a, some dates set. July 10th, we're going to have oral arguments in that case focused solely on whether or not the hospital assessment, which pays for 300,000 people to get insurance in this state, is a tax that requires a two-thirds vote to the legislature, as the legislature says, Which it or didn't not. get. Which or, it didn't get. Which it and didn't that, get. And that's the or key. Not. 
And, and you know, that's what we're down to here. Okay, so that's what we're down here. And we, we didn't even talk about Plan B as far as education funding is yes. concerned. There, there the, is no Plan B. I got news for you. On this one, there is no Plan B. I mean, you know, the, the Senate president may say, oh, we can find a way to keep some of these people on, even if we don't bring in the, the, the 175 million or whatever it is a year yes. from this hospital tax assessment levy, whatever you want to call it. But the fact is there is no plan B. The problem they've got is the same problem the Republicans in Congress have. If you take away people's insurance, now that they've come to expect it, what do you replace it with? Right. That's and the problem with killing Obamacare is what do you right. replace it and with? And we're filling budget holes and we have hospitals that aren't near bankruptcy because they're finally getting some compensation. This is a big problem for the governor. And interestingly, he took his name off this lawsuit today as a defendant. <laughs> What's that all about? What does that mean? You know, I don't know. Now, Jan Brewer automatically was replaced by Doug Ducey when Doug Ducey came in office. I don't know why. Uh, now, it's just Tom Betlack, the access director, who's the defendant. I don't know if that's covered for the governor. I don't know mm -hmm. if, as the papers say, it's just for the convenience of not having to serve so many people. Is this one of the reasons why we're not hearing a heck of a lot of budget talks, negotiations, because the goalposts are moving all over the field? Uh, well, uh, negotiations are happening. I mean, things are happening down at the Capitol. I, I think it's just a matter of what kind of a budget, you know, if they pass a budget quickly, are they going to have to come back yeah. and do it? I mean, the reality is this Medicaid issue not going to be settled before they're done with the budget. It's not going to be settled before the end of the year. I mean, mm -hmm. we're, we're looking at probably at least a year, year and a half out before we get a final answer on that. Education will probably get more clarity, I'd say, in the next few months. All right. We've got to stop it right there. Good stuff. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Monday on Arizona Horizon, the president of the State Board of Regents weighs in on cuts to university funding, and we'll preview this year's edition of Baseball Spring Training in the Valley. That's Monday, 5.30 and 10 on Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great weekend. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.